and would actually help build support for KPFA. Also, we had during the last uh, La Labor Day, we had a uh, a Labor Day show of, of from Southern California and Northern California, KPFK and KPFA. <coughs> so we're able to have a statewide show. We want to do more of that um, so that we have statewide labor programming uh, in Los Angeles and the Bay Area on privatization, health care, immigration, and workers' rights. So thank you, Sharon, for making that presentation. Okay, so without further ado, uh, our speaker now is Steve Donnelly, and uh, he's going to be talking about uh, use of communication technology and he's got a slideshow. So welcome to Steve Donald. Mic check, mic check. All right, so we're going to talk about the good old-fashioned website with all the talk about social media and other ways of communicating. Uh, you still need a good old-fashioned website, so we're going to talk at a very high level about what goes into a website. You know, we're not going to get any into any specifics. I'm not going to be able to teach you how to build a website in 25 minutes. Uh, we're just going to talk about all the key things that you need to think about uh, for your website. Uh, I'm Steve Donnelly. I'm the owner of Prometheus Labor Communications. We specialize in building uh, websites for labor unions. So if you're in the market for one, we hope you'll consider us and, and give us a call. We can talk about how we can help you out. All right, so as I said, yes, you definitely still need a website. Uh, why do you need a website in these days, you know, with Facebook and Twitter? Uh, number one is to so that you can get found by search engines. Now, search engines are extremely important in finding information. I'm sure each of you in this room probably uses Google or some search engine at least once a day to find information that you're interested in. Uh, Facebook's information is kind of locked up in, in, locked up in there. Uh, tweets disappear after a certain amount of time. And so a website is still the best way to get found uh, through a search engine. It also gives you much more control over the visual presentation of your information. Uh, you can do limited amounts of this with Facebook. You can have individual pages up there. Uh, but really, you know, there's nothing that you can do uh, to really call attention to important things that are going on. Uh, you know, your information is going to get buried in the Facebook interface and, and people likely aren't even going to click those tabs. They're going to go right to the, the news stream and they're going to leave a comment. So, you know, the website is, you know, an online brochure and you can <coughs> stylize it any way you want. You can customize it with, uh, with photographs and other kinds of visual uh, elements. And of course, the website gives you legitimacy. Um, you know, if you don't have a website, you know, people probably aren't going to take you seriously unless you've got something that's really incredible um, and uh, you know striking that's going to go viral through Facebook or YouTube. Um, you know, you need a website so that people can get a sense for what you're about. Okay, the first thing you need, of course, is a domain name. Um, these are very cheap, on the order of between ten and twenty dollars a year. Uh, one important thing uh, when you're deciding upon a domain name is get something that's going to uh, rank you highly in the search engine ranking. So if you're, you know, a union uh, that represents a particular type of worker and you want to get the message out to that type of worker, might be a good idea. So let's say you want to organize maids. Uh, you could get a domain name called We Organize Maids. And someone who does a search on organizing maids, uh, you know, that, that website would come up at or near the top. The search engines pl uh, place a lot of <coughs> emphasis on the domain name. So you want to take your time and, and consider it carefully. Don't worry so much about the length of the domain name. Uh, most people aren't typing your domain name directly into the browser anyway. Uh, they're going to click on a link to get to your website. Okay, hosting your website, uh, cheaper isn't necessarily better. Um, you know, if you've got the resources, uh, spend the money on a host uh, that, you know, isn't going to skimp on the resources devoted to your website. Uh, there's a lot of what are called shared hosts. Uh, so, that, you know, they'll put hundreds and thousands of websites on a single server uh, in order to keep their costs down. Uh, that's a very bad thing. If one of those websites get hit with a lot of traffic, your website is going to be affected as well. Um, you can, if you've got more resources, you can get what's called a uh, virtual server. And, uh, you know, it, it'll, it'll be able to handle a higher traffic load. And if you've got a really heavily trafficked website, you might want to consider getting, your, getting or renting your own server in a, uh, what's called a co-located uh, data center. And uh, the other important thing is to make sure that uh, you get a platform uh, or get a hosting, uh, a host that will support your platform. 
you know, the software that you're going to use, which we'll talk about a little bit, uh, may not be supported by a particular host. So you want to check with them to make sure of that. So do you do it yourself or do you hire someone? Well, it depends on your resources, of course. Uh, do it yourself <coughs> is cheaper, but it's not always going to get you quality results. You know, I could probably figure out how to build a deck myself, but you know, I'm really not mechanically inclined and I don't have the patience and it's going to look awful. I'm going to have a lopsided deck that's just going to look terrible. So if you do have the resources, I recommend um, you know, hiring someone out. Um, when you're looking for someone to hire, you know, the real key is to uh, look at their past work and you'll be able to get a really good sense for you know, what they can deliver for you. And uh, you know, finding a good developer is like finding a good mate. You, know, you may not particular, particularly work well with a developer, even though they do great work. They may have a style that you don't like. Uh, so you know, take your time and, and uh, talk to different vendors. Okay, what you're definitely going to want to use is a uh, content management system or software. <coughs> um, you know, this is kind of a standard way of uh, uh, building and maintaining websites these days. And what that is, is it just basically makes it easier for a non-technical person to be able to add content into the website, whether it be photographs or videos or text. 99% uh, of websites today are using content management systems. All right, so one frequently asked question is uh, which content management software or system do you use? Well, one basic decision is open source or free software versus proprietary software. And I think everybody, you know, heard Richard Stallman talk yesterday, or was it the day before? Was it yesterday? Uh, talk about, you know, some of the pernicious elements of uh, proprietary software. You don't own it or control it. Uh, whereas open source software, you can do anything you want with it. their sandbox and you can't change it you, know, you can't uh, you can only do what they allow you to do uh, it's easier to find a knowledgeable developer so you know there's kind of, there's experts in uh, uh, building with these content management systems all over the place and uh, it's, of course it's free to download completely free to use but you may still have to pay for hosting of course that's hosting is completely different uh, from the software Okay, so there's three big uh, gorillas in the open source content management system world, Drupal, WordPress, and Joomla. I'll just quickly go over uh, what these are ideal for. So Drupal is ideal for uh, online communities or sites that require a lot of, uh, lots of customization. That's what we use to build our websites for labor unions. Uh, you know, every union is different and it's important for us to have flexibility to really customize that website for that particular union. So uh, we use Drupal. Uh, WordPress is ideal for blog-like websites. Uh, yeah, you can build pretty sophisticated uh, websites with WordPress, but you know that's not what they're ideally suited for. Uh, they're ideally for you know blog-like. That's how they work out of the box. They're a blog, and they're pretty much ready to go. They're super easy. You go to WordPress.com right now, and have yourself a blog set in five minutes. And even if you don't have a lot of experience with content management systems, you can pretty well figure out how to get stuff up there. Uh, Joomla <coughs> is more ideal for brochure type sites. Um, and what I mean by that is maybe you've got a small business or uh, you just want to put out information. You know, it's a nice track of websites that they have and they're fairly easy to maintain. Uh, some proprietary CMSs that are out there. Um, I really haven't used any uh, with much, uh, to, too much, to uh, a large degree. Uh, there's one called Squarespace. Uh, if you're in a really tight budget and you can't hire a designer, uh, you know you might want to go with Squarespace. It's kind of a do-it-yourself, so that basically anybody with very little experience can design a, a website. And it's still going to take some work. Uh, but you don't need any external software. You don't have to worry about external editing tools or anything like that. So that might be one way to go. Now there's another extremely interesting uh, proprietary content management system called Nation Builder. 
<coughs> and Nation Builder is actually much more than a content management system. And uh, for those who attended the session uh, yesterday, uh, we talked about it in more detail. If we have time, maybe I'll show a video, but I don't think we do. But in short, Nation Builder allows you to um, marshal all the people that are interested in your cause and uh, using social media, because for, you use Nation Builder to throw out a wide net uh, through social media, Twitter, Facebook, uh, mail, and uh, basically allows you to collect and uh, use all the data from people who are interested about your cause, puts it into a database, and allows you to easily reach out uh, to your supporters. And it's very sophisticated. I highly recommend uh, checking it out. Uh, there is a fee to it. The more features that you use, the, the higher the cost. You could run $100 to $200 a month, depending on the features that you use. If you use just some very basic features, it's about $20 a month. But uh, definitely check that out. And Steve, you know, for you know, book uh, selling, might be an ideal platform for that. Again, the real advantage is it's tightly integrated with social media. Um, and again, as I already mentioned, the major drawback to these proprietary CMS is you have no control. You get what you get and you can't change it. Oh. <coughs> okay, design. I'll just talk really quickly about design. Uh, it is extremely important. People do judge your website by how it looks. Um, now, that said, don't throw a lot of money into the design. It can be very expensive to do a really highly stylized uh, website. What I recommend doing is just finding another website that you like and copy it, mimic it. You know, maybe change the colors, you know, obviously change the graphics a little bit, uh, get a designer, uh, pay a few hundred dollars to get them to do a nice logo. Uh, but don't start from scratch, you're just you're, you're wasting your time and money. I mean, there's a lot of great designs out there, you know, copy. Uh, content um, is extremely important and for, for most websites. I, you know, some websites are just set up to be a brochure site, but if you really want the kind of site where people are coming back and visiting it daily, get really good, unique content, and uh, you know people are going to come back to your website. <coughs> uh, you know, it's going to build your reputation. You know, much more than a static site that that really doesn't change. Uh, but this is really the hardest part about building a website. This is what takes the most resources and time and thought and energy. <coughs> So if you don't have that kind of uh, resources, your best bet is to go with just a very simple website, maybe two, three pages that gets the basics out there, uh, and then use social media to kind of get the word out about uh, who you are and what you do. Okay, really quickly on integration with social media. You know, obviously it's uh, something you're gonna wanna do if you want people to know about you. It's an excellent way to reach people. Um, you know, at the bare minimum, you want links to your Facebook and your YouTube and your Twitter account and all the different uh, social networks that you uh, are part of. Uh, you can also have your Twitter feeds come into your website. It's very easy to do. Um, you know, you can put your like buttons up there so people can like you immediately right on the website. Um, you can also do fancier stuff like integrate Facebook comments in. So if you're doing blog posts and you don't want to use the comment system, uh, integrated in with that uh, blog, you can use Facebook and integrate your site uh, that way. It's also a lot of fancier things you can do. You can have people log into your website using Facebook, um, but that gets more expensive, and and uh, you really need uh, a plan to figure out how that should all work. All right, once the site is built, um, or while you're building it, too, you're going to want to take into consideration search engine optimization. That means getting your website uh, ranked highly uh, by the search engines. Uh, a few keys, there's a few keys that you should understand about this. Uh, first, don't spend huge amounts of money for search engine optimizations. I mean, there's people out there charging three, four hundred dollars an hour, you know, for attorneys, you know, who have the resources, but a lot of them, you know, don't work. And they may even do some things that are underhanded and Google could actually knock you down in the search and rank ranking. So these kinds of outfits can hurt rather than help. So, you know, unless you really trust the outfit, uh, I, I wouldn't spend a lot of money optimizing your site. So let me just talk about the few things that you can do easily to get uh, your, your uh, website out there. So as I said before, the domain name is a huge factor. So put the words uh, in your website that, you know, whatever your website is about, uh, put that right in the domain name. So if you're SEIU Local 1021, 
put in SEIU Local 1021, and you'll come up at the top of the uh, search engine rankings. <coughs> Another big factor, I forgot to put it on here, is um, you know time. The longer your website has been around, uh, the more highly ranked it will be. So if you've been around for 10 years, uh, you're going to rank much higher than a website that's been around for 10 months. So it does take time. It's not going to happen overnight. Uh, you just have to be patient uh, with that. Um, you also want to make sure your website uses what are called friendly URLs. Uh, most websites do this now out of the box. But what I mean by that is um, you, know, you might have a website, uh, myunion.org slash 123 slash node slash adf.html. It's just totally nonsensical. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, you know, it's just what the machine understands. So what you want to use instead are friendly URLs. This is similar to, you know, why you want to use the keywords in the domain name. Uh, this is so that the search engines, again, will look at the URL and highly rank that page based on the words in the domain or in the URL. Um, and of course, <coughs> you'll want unique content that can't be found anywhere else, content that's compelling, because what that does is get you to have people linked into your website. And that is really the ultimate key uh, to getting high search engine ranking is get people to link to your website. You can do it you know, by putting out great content, but you can also do it by asking other people to link to your website. Just a few websites linking to you will greatly boost your search engine ranking. The other key is if you can get other popular websites to link to you, so if you're mentioned in the New York Times, your search engine ranking is going to go up much higher than if you're mentioned on your friend's uh, blog that nobody reads. All right. Okay, once the site is built, um, you're going to want to uh, monitor it, see uh, who's coming. Um, you know, you don't have to do this, but a lot of unions obviously are interested in you know, whether the website is successful or not. And so it's always a good idea to track you know, how many hits you're getting. And it's not really necessarily, you don't worry about the number of hits, but what you want to see is you know, an increase in the number of hits. If they start going down, uh, you've got problems and that's something you want to address. Uh, but as long as there's a uh, you know, steady increase uh, you know, week from week to week or month to month, that's a good sign that you're, you're doing things well and doing things right. Uh, there's free software, or not software, but um, a free service by Google called Google Analytics. Uh, you simply uh, drop in a little bit of code onto your web page. Uh, a lot of content management systems make this very easy to do. And uh, you go to Google and it will track the number of hits that you have and where they came from and you can uh, get a really good sense of uh, you know, how people are finding your site and what they're looking at. And that concludes just the overview of uh, websites. Any questions at all? Well, uh, a couple of comments and questions. So about getting a domain, oh, about hosting. GoDaddy uh -huh. um, no uh, was, uh, I was told that, well, I know that it operates out of Arizona, which, uh, and so there's a whole pot of very religious policy. So yeah, GoDaddy's gotten in trouble for a number of things. Yeah, uh, the sexism in their sexism in their ads. Uh, their owner was hunting elephants and you know showed videos of himself you know hunting uh, elephants. I wasn't familiar with the immigration stuff, but yeah, they've got a controversial CEO. So yeah. don't don't use GoDaddy. Yeah. Anyway, um, what I have found is that maintaining content is great to build and whatever. But once you have the website, you need people to commit themselves to updating the content. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. If you, if you don't have that, like I said, just put up a simple site and use a social networking uh, to kind of interact with people. <coughs> what would you suggest to launch a site that's not associated directly with the What would you use to launch it? To launch it to get that initial uh, setup. It really depends what you're trying to do. I mean, if you just want to, I mean, I, was, I would always start simple. You know, don't go overboard. You know, don't spend ten thousand dollars on it. Uh, just set up a simple WordPress blog. Really, content is the key, um, and you know, good design. If you can get a nice professional-looking website, there's a lot of templates that you can use. 
But spend some money on the on the logo and some of the graphics. That'll help out a lot. Sorry, I didn't quite mean that. Once yeah. you've got all that, yeah. To initially promote it. Oh yeah, social networking, sure. You know, mail lists, but uh, really compelling content. You know, if you can get something that's really interesting, that's going to draw people into in the know itself. They're going to link to you. They're going to put it on Twitter, and uh, you know, that's really the key content. We'll go left to right. Um, I had a really good experience with Unions America as a web host. They they host a lot of unions websites. They have a kind of a frame that it's not totally flexible, so you have to like their frame, but then you develop your own content. And they're pretty reasonable and they're pretty responsive. I had a good experience with them. Um, I do have a question, and that is, um, we have a complicated website that has to do with labor law for building trades. And we need to index it. And I haven't really You found mean a, like a searchable? Yeah, we have a site map, but it's not really quite <coughs> adequate. So yeah, we need what, to make it more searchable. What is it built with? Pardon me? What is it built with? It's a, uh, we use, uh, it's on Unions America, but it's, it's a, they're Word docs, and you just change them into HT, what is it? HTML, HTML, yeah. and then post. Yeah, I mean, Use America is a proprietary product. Uh, they're competitors, so you know, if I'm bad mouthing them, that's that's why. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, there's you, they're proprietary, so you really can't do anything uh, with their software. You would have to ask them to implement that feature. There's nothing you can really do. You know, I think they do have a search engine built into their sites, but you know, I just don't know how good it is. But it's based on on Word docs. The content is we control the content. You you you're saying you want the Word docs to be searchable? Exactly. <coughs> yeah, you would need uh, some software called Apache Solaire. And they probably don't have it. Okay. Apache Solaire will do that. Allow you be able to upload PDFs, Word docs, and those will be searchable. But it's got to be on the server. And so. But talk to me. We'll be happy to take your business. No, I just wanted to see if you um, would share like what are the best, what unions are doing well in terms of content and what kind of content are they putting up there that's actually getting traffic? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I wish there were more examples I could give you. You know, a lot of unions will do canned type of stuff, you know. Um, yeah. We're just not very good at propaganda, you know. It's, AFL-CIO is doing some stuff with the blog, I think it's good, uh, but you know, when I read the stuff, it's not very compelling, and I, I really can't think of a website with content that, like, knocks my socks off. Would you would say that, like, infographics or whatever they're called are, like, a good way to go, or it just seems yeah. like... they're expensive to do, though, and do well, they are. you know? You're gonna, you have to have a graphic artist, you have to be able to tell them the concept, and they have to be able to put it into a visual, put it in a visually compelling way. So, yeah, there's, you know, I wish I could say, hey, there's tons of examples out there, but I'm sure there are. I'm not saying that there's none. I just can't think of any off the top of my head. Um, Steve, forgive my ignorance, but could you explain a little bit more how Nation Build works, the details? Of yeah, well, let me pull up the site. So I've only really kind of uh, dabbled, dabbled with Nation Builder. I'm thinking about uh, you know, kind of partnering with them to uh, provide services for unions for the use of Nation Builder. So um, this is their website, nationbuilder.com. Um, one thing you might be confused by is the software was initially geared for politicians. Uh, the guy who started Nation Builders, uh, kind of a radical thinker. He wants to uh, democratize everything, and he decided that uh, you know he's going to start with politics, which is a pretty good place to start because that's that's democracy. Um, so he wanted to create an extremely powerful platform that would take the power kind of away, not away from campaigns, but uh, put more of the power of running these campaigns into the hands of the nation, and the nation is nothing more than. A, a metaphor for your followers and your supporters. So you build these nations, um, and the way you build them is you, is you put up the website using the content management system. And one thing about Nation Builder is the content management system is kind of limited. 
but for most people, it's probably going to do what you need. You'll be able to put up your own pages. Um, you know, you'll be able to put up a way to collect an email address. You'll be able to put up your Twitter and Facebook links. All that's very easily, very easy to do. But the real power of uh, Nation Builders under the hood, you'll get this system here, uh, the dashboard. And you can see now this is just a test site that I built. Um, and I plugged in my Twitter feeds and my uh, you know, Facebook account. And uh, you know, those people then become potential supporters of your nation. And using this dashboard, uh, you can get people involved with your cause. So you can have, what's really cool I think, is you can have a broadcast, you know, do it in the context of an organizing campaign. You would set up this website and your leaders of the campaign would be broadcasters and they would have the ability to broadcast out to their friends and their family about uh, your cause. And these broadcasters are basically you know, co-leaders of your nation and you can give them uh, different uh, powers. You, know, you can give them power to post on your Twitter feed or post on your Facebook feed. Um, just one thing I was going to mention about that too that was good. Get there. Oh, you can give uh, political capital to your supporters. And this is what's called uh, gamification. Um, I'm trying to think of what you guys may be familiar with. Uh, it's kind of like uh, a ranking system. So the more your supporters do for your cause, the more political capital that they can acquire. And so you can track, you know, hey, who are the real leaders of this campaign? Who's doing the most uh, to get the word out there about our cause? Is that like what the AFL CIO did for the yes, election? Yes. Yes. Where every yes. time you would like do a phone bank, you get so many points, right. and you can use it for something. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's that's gamification. That's a new buzzword that's come up uh, the past year or two, uh, and everything seems to be moving <coughs> toward that. Now it's been around for quite a while. I mean, I was on websites uh, in 2000, you know, where they you know you, you gain experience points by you know, posting valuable information to the <coughs> community. And people would rate you, and you would get status, you know, in this community. Yeah, that's the same thing here. So people, you know, want to show, hey, I, I'm, I'm a big supporter of this, and you can tell because you know I've got you know 1,000 pieces of political capital. You know, so you know the, the idea is it's going to motivate people to do more. They want to get to the top and really support the cause. So that's a really uh, huge feature, I think. Uh, you know, you can dismiss it as, hey, you know, it's kind of corny, but you know, I don't know, it works, you know. Um, competition, and this is the strength of capitalism, I have to admit, uh, is a motivating factor for people. So, yeah, so through this dashboard, you can reach out to uh, your, your supporters, you can find new supporters, and you can target people in many, many, many different ways. The best thing I would say is uh, watch the videos on there, um, the help videos. Uh, this one here, the very first video, will give you a good idea of what it's about. This basic concepts one. It's only about eight minutes or so. Can you control who, who your followers are? I mean, you got a real, a real anti-union legislator on that first list. So, if you don't necessarily want to educate your enemies, do you have control? Uh, I'm not entirely sure, but yeah, I mean, you can tightly target, you know, who your message goes out to. But the thing is, you can't. You know, you got to engage. You can't be afraid of, uh, you know, who's following you, and let that stop you from communicating. Get your message out. Get your message out to your enemies. You know, um, maybe they'll see the light. Okay. Or they'll get worried. Yeah. I mean, we, we spoke yesterday. There are powerful forces that want to destroy unions. They highly Absolutely. skilled in hacking into these kinds of sites. And we have to be aware of that and have some defense. Yeah, Some I mean, legal protection. It would be it would be illegal to hack a site. I mean, that you could get the FBI on. Hopefully, we're not to the point where the well, government. I mean, we need to the government does legal, nothing. Legal skills as well when we're doing this. Be aware of it. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't lose sleep over it. I, the odds of you getting hacked are pretty slim. Uh, you know, I don't know of any union websites that are being targeted maliciously by uh, any entities. I just it's not something that happens. You, know, you, you, you most most have to worry about are what, what are called script kitties. And these are people who just like find a random site, or you know, maybe your organization pissed this kid off for whatever reason. Uh, they might be able to do some damage. But you know, the best defense against that is to have backups of your website, 
And if you do get hacked, you can just put it right back up. One more question. Uh, two things. One, <clears throat> good uh, labor website. I think it's California Nurses Association. They have pretty good content, and they have links to a Flickr, you know, photos and what that's. So they're pretty active. Uh, yeah. One question. I was looking for a. I was looking online for a union member to try to identify correctly which union he was a member of. Um, and when I did the search for his name and the union, <clears throat> the first ten things that came up were all really negative attacks on him in particular and that union. Yeah. Now they're organizing drive that they're doing right now. So yeah. I was thinking there must be a way for folks to check those kind of websites themselves and see how can I make sure the rankings that come up show yeah. something positive and link directly to my union website instead right. of these negative news stories from the management side. And then also... Right, the uh, only way to counteract that is offense. There's no way to stop yeah, it. I mean, so you got to gotta do what you can. Monitor that and then put your own news out there. But the other yeah. thing is, aren't there within the software or the, the content management systems, aren't there tags that you can use within the text to then, you know, those become highlighted in search engines and drive traffic to your site? Yes, yeah. I mean, you can group your stories by a category, and those categories might be displayed across the top of the page. So the search engines will look at the size of the text. Hey, that's uh, this this page is probably about that topic because it's in such large such a large font size. So yeah, that could definitely help. Okay. okay, thank you. All right, thanks. Okay, um, our next speaker uh, is uh, an activist, uh, parent, and has been working for many years now on uh, fighting charters and ex researching charters uh, uh, and how they're affecting public education. And uh, it's Sharon Higgins and she lives in Oakland. And uh, we just had a discussion earlier talking about uh, uh, Gulen, the Gulen movement, and she has been a key person in helping to get information out uh, about the Gulen movement and the Gulen schools. And I, I think that uh, it, it has some lessons for what we need to do uh, all over the United States and internationally in examining, using the, uh, uh, the web to research and examine the role of privatizers and those who want to destroy the labor movement and public education. So welcome to Sharon Higgins. Hi. 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 Thank you, Steve. Um, first of all, Sam, I feel like I'm kind of an outsider because I don't belong to a union. I was a nurse and I belonged to a union then, but um, that was many years ago and I haven't been working at that. And um, and so, I, you know, I kind of, I'm an Oakland public school parent. My younger daughter graduated in um, two years ago, so I was in the school district for 18 years. I was really an early active parent when I was there. So. Um, but sort of my interest in the privatization of public education, which is going on, and which is fairly far advanced, uh, I can tell you, um, it came when um, our school district was taken over by the state for um, financial reasons, and the state superintendent sent us um, a series of three um, state administrators who had been trained by the Broad Superintendents Academy. So that was all sort of becoming aware of who Eli Broad was. He's one of the billionaires boys clubs is um, Diane Ravitch, who's a professor who um, is very prominent in kind of resisting this public education reform um, movement. Um, that's how she referred to them. So anyway, I'm just kind of all like constantly learning about this and, and I have the time to um, do research, and so I did. So um, my, I guess my presentation here is more kind of a personal narrative and my, my, the pathway I've taken over the past, um, I don't know, five, six years or so to kind of get me where I am today, and, and I'll share some of the things I've, I've learned with you. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I've been working as a parent coordinator at my daughter's uh, middle school. And that was a part-time job for me, and I had been doing that for seven years. And then um, at one, I was just kind of, I was pretty happy at that job. And uh, you know, we helped get it, get uh, school communication out to the parent body, and basically received phone calls, helped do them trouble, help troubleshoot them. And we just you know tried to 
um, kind of fill in those gaps for the school that, that he couldn't do. So there were three of us working there. Um, I, was, I was the first one they brought in. We had a, a woman come in who um, could speak um, and write Chinese and Vietnamese, and we had a Spanish parent coordinator. So we were just kind of coming along doing really well. And one day I was um, called into the principal's office. Well, you're having trouble getting paid, and it's complicated. But, but anyway, you know, basically the district asked me to resign. And that was because I was writing letters that were opposing the reform measures that the state administration was doing. That's what I felt. They told me they thought I looked unhappy. But uh, <laughs> and I thought it would be a good idea if I resigned. So anyway, I, that kind of, kind of shocked me. And um, you know, I was contacted by the school. I wasn't a union member. It was a, you know, under, under contract from the school directly. So, so um, I thought, that's great. You know, I don't want to be involved with this setting anymore either at that point. And so I, I left and I started a blog. So, because I just had all these sort of opinions and ideas and stuff. So my first blog that I started was um, nearly five years ago, and it's called The Perimeter Primate. You know, I was really, really brand new to everything at that time. I used um, Blogspot, which is kind of similar to WordPress. It's, I think, it goes through Google. And uh, just kind of this rudimentary blogging, and I, you know, research and I would write. But anyway, I just, I got more and more into like doing research and um, finding those connections between, um, you know, the Broad superintendent or who was sitting on boards of charter schools and I mean just like there's just like so much out there that um, of these connections that are working hard to privatize public education that is, is not being presented in the media. So I, it's, so the way I look at my blogs would be a place to um, deposit the find my findings, and uh, rather than doing, I did some kind of narrative, kind of opinion writing, um, but I think they mostly became a place for me to put my research. And uh, so the second blog I started um, was called the Broad Report. I had done so much uh, research into the uh, what. Uh, the Broad Foundation was doing in terms of um, what they what they do is they create personnel who then are kind of go out and get hired. They arrange to get hired by these school districts, and then once they get there, they have this whole network of people that they bring in who are also like Broad interns, Broad training interns. And so it's, the, it's all this certain ideology. And so anyway, I, I created this one called the Broad Report. Um, after a couple of years after Perimeter Primate, and then I mean, I really I spread myself too thin, um, but that's that's how it's how it's done, how it's been done. Um, about two and a half years ago, I decided because there was so much um, propaganda going out about charter schools and nothing to counter it. There just like was not that much online at the time, and still is not enough. Um, so I, cre I thought, okay, there, I know there are all these bad stories about charter schools, so I just started another blog spot blog named, um, and I named it Charter School Scandals. So, uh, and that was only going to be, I was just going to compile stories, news stories that were coming across. It was just, you know, it was a place where they could be deposited. So people could see that, that, that number one, these schools aren't necessarily all that they're cracked up to be, and, um, and kind of, it was just a good way to monitor, and it's like a one-stop shop uh, place to find out about problems with charter schools and all the kind of different issues that were coming up. Um, very immediately, when I started doing um, compiling my stories for that blog, uh, I just I just set out. I do things like Google charter school embezzlement, charter school problems, charter school complaints, charter school whatever. You know, just Google and. Uh, first um, stories that early on, uh, very soon, um, stories that came up were about these Turkish-run charter schools. So um, that you know, there was there was a story of some concerns about a school in Utah. There was concerns about a s school in Arizona, um, and then I realized, oh, there's a school in Oakland that is a charter school that I remember looking at the board members' names and not recognizing the nationality. Sure enough, I went back and looked at those into the nationality of all those names, they were Turkish names. I thought, okay, this is just like, 
what are the chances of this, you know? And then, and then it just like everything started snowballing. So I, so I, at this point, perimeter primate is kind of stalled. Road report is kind of stalled. But charter school scandals is what my interest is, and I still am compiling the news stories that I that I have come fed to me by um, Google Alerts, and then I also do independent research um, into the um, the Google and charter schools, and that has just you know really expanded. So um, so you know basically for me you know the blogs are to a way to. Get, try make an attempt to get information out there that's not being presented anywhere else. Um, you know, our side, you know, the resistance to this privatization, um, just, you know, we're, uh, we're behind. You know, it's been underway for a long time. The people are so wealthy and it's been so well strategized. And, um, so, you know, hopefully, you know, some of the developments that are happening, you know, it, now they're actually talking about it on, you know, on MSNBC. They actually use, I was listening to one of those news shows, they actually said something about, you know, the privatization of public education within the last six months, which is, that's new. I mean, from when I was starting this all those years, you know, five years ago, it went for years that you would never hear anybody even utter that concept. Um, so, I'm, um, so I, I think we're, you know, we're definitely making progress, but um, a lot more has to come. Um, I guess, oh yeah, so anyway, with all of my blogs, what's been really interesting to watch is how um, helpful they've been at um, connecting me and connecting other people with uh, what's going on. Like, for instance, uh, I had this road report that I just kind of independently did, you know, in my dining room, my computer, and um, then I would get it, then I got an email from somebody who was in Seattle who really identified with the content and what I had described, and, and lo and behold, they had a road superintendent they were having trouble with. So this uh, parent from Seattle contacted me and, and and then, you know, she eventually, they started their own blog up there. There were two of them. I was also contacted by somebody from North Carolina. I mean, you have to realize, you know, I'm not part, I'm an independent person. I'm not part of any group or anything. I'm just kind of driven by um, my feelings about this topic. And so I'm getting contacted by people from around the country. And I, I also contacted people in, in New York City um, who are, um, active there and and you know all this just built up and uh, that was maybe you know maybe like just four years ago and we uh, as far as the parent group goes uh, the set of parents that I connected with they all knew somebody else and we eventually ended up forming a organization called Parents Across America and um, that has its own website now and um, and it's actually, you know, been picked up by uh, people in the press, and and they'll contact us for stories, um, and so that's been a good development. Um, now, as far as the the charter school scandals, the Gulen, the Gulen charter school business, and and all of that. Um, once I started posting about that, you know, what was really weird about it for me was that at that time there was a um, protest against one of their schools opening in uh, Texas, but it's the West Texas Patriots. So see, I'm now having communication with people who are West Texas Patriots, which is really very unlikely for me because I'm not, you know, <laughs> I'm not part of the Tea Party. <laughs> and. Um, so that was kind of that was one really interesting development is you know how this ties in people, uh, and also like when I started, it took me a while to figure out what was going. It took me a while to figure out what was going on with the Gulen movement, who they were, you know, where where to go with it, and um, and sort of along those lines, um, I started on my blog. I can tell I have a um, I paid for a hit, a hit counter service that also will give me my refer and the uh, URLs and where they're from. And so 
I could see that people from you know Department of Homeland Security were visiting my blog. I had a lot of people from Turkey visiting my blog. <laughs> you know, I had somebody one one hit from the like the it was the office of the president was like visiting my blog. I've had ClaytonState.gov, which is uh, when you go online, you go, we go, what is that? And it's like some people have attached it to the CIA visiting my blog. I mean, here I am, right? I'm this mom in Oakland who's involved with public schools, and I'm getting hits on my blog from you know Department of Homeland Security and ClaytonState.gov. So you know, there's something important going on. So. Um, The other thing that's been happening with my um, Charlottesville Scandals blog is that I've become kind of a, um, to a very small degree though, you know, a kind of a national help and advice center for people who are having trouble at their charter schools who don't have anywhere else to go, right? So they'll find my Charlottesville Scandals blog and they'll write to me and they'll, they'll tell me they'll, their story and, and you know, I do the best I can. If somebody from LA was feeling bullied by a charter school parent with her son just last week, and I have I know a couple of people in LA, so I thought, okay, well, let me try and put her see if they know anybody where she can go to because it really people don't have any. You know, you're supposed to uh, vote with your feet and you know leave these schools and there's there's no the board. The school district doesn't do the oversight of them. They're not they're not interested in the trouble um, unless it's egregious, really egregious. And um, your local board members, they're not overseeing. The charter schools have their own board, so, so the local school boards aren't overseeing the charter schools directly. So, uh, so I guess you know, people don't have a place to go. They, they come to me sometimes. Um, is there, if, when, if I talk about this Gulen movement business, which is a really dominant part of my life right now, it, I don't know, is everybody here? Understand what that is, Steve? You kind of talked about that earlier. I wasn't here for that. Um, so, Fatuli Gulen is a um, imam from Turkey who has a lot of followers. He started um, gathering his followers followers up in the say, late 1960s, mostly through the 1970s. And one of the things they do is start schools around the world. Um, start school, start schools. So they started schools in Turkey. Um, they would sort of bring in people to the movement at their boarding houses and dormitories and at their schools or after school tutoring centers. They'd get more followers. Um, when the Soviet Union dissolved in the uh, early 1990s, then they started, school, started uh, opening schools in primarily um, Central Asia, for, former regions belonging to the Ottoman Empire and um, Turkic regions, as, yes, as they're called. Um, and now they are uh, everywhere. Um, they started their first school in the United States in 1999, two, two of their charter s schools in, um, in Ohio. And now they have 135, and we're uh, monitoring. They're, they're, they're trying to start two more in Massachusetts. Um, they're trying to start one in Virginia. Um, that, you know, Every year they start more. So um, I think in terms of labor, sort of the main interest uh, that, that, that labor should have in this is that, well, number one, they're charter schools, so none of their employees are unionized. Um, there was this charter, one of their schools in Chicago, well, their school, school in Chicago, the teachers tried organizing, and um, it was a pregnant teacher who was trying to lead the, the um, organizing, because in Chicago, there are some, there is a union for charter school teachers. And um, she was pregnant, but she was fired, and then that caused a lot of uproar. And um, that time, the school claimed that it was a private school, so it didn't have to uh, allow for its teachers to be unionized. But, um, and I think that, that it was being looked at the net by the National Labor Relations Board, but I don't know what this, it was never resolved that I've ever seen. Um, but, so that's one thing, is the fact that they're charter schools. Um, the other issue with the, Gulen movement's charter school personnel is that um, they import a lot of their own members into the country, um, preferentially, um, to, to hire them. Um, the members of this movement call themselves uh, hizmet. They refer to themselves as volunteers or service. And I think that, you know, I guess that's to them, it's they're doing service on behalf of their movement. But certainly when they are brought over to the United States on visas, they're getting you know, full-time American salaries. 
Um, oftentimes, the imported teachers have lesser duties than the American teachers. And say, for instance, they might teach four uh, periods where the American teachers that they hire teach um, five. And, um, and then also they bring their family members in, the family members, the wives are often given jobs. I mean, it's just whole displacement of um, American teachers um, through the uh, Gulen Charter Schools. And um, so that's why I think the um, AFT and the NEA should be more interested in this whole thing. But so far, I don't detect any interest. Um, Oh, one thing that was kind of interesting that um, Steve had mentioned about was about um, websites and, um, you know, the ranking on uh, Google searches. And um, at least in terms of the uh, Gulen Charter School issue, uh, they've been doing, a lot, a lot of the members are very, very sophisticated with computers. Um, and they've been doing a lot of damage control. And you know, at one point last year, I was looking weekly at, I was just uh, typing uh, Gulen Charter Schools, and um, and for a while, I you know, with the uh, set of uh, Google's findings, the top ten that would come up would be kind of like there was a New York Times article, there were you know, there was a USA Today article. It would be that type of thing. And then there start to be the emergence of these new websites coming up um, that were produced by members of the movement in support of the schools, like, um, you know, the people who are saying that there are Gulen charter schools are, you know, uh, uh, slandering the schools. Yeah, I mean, they're just misses that you can go, just Google it. You'll see all these fun, funky websites. Um, but I guess you know they might know Google Analytics or something somehow, and then you would see these. these well, yeah, what they do is they will just create a bunch of different websites, mm -hmm. and you know they'll get people to link to the websites. It's, just, it's called you're basically gaming Google so At, that your content gets to the top. Well, I, we were uh, the people who I know who are also interested in this topic who work on it. You know, we were watching that happen before our eyes, and. Um, so if you you know go online, like I say now in Google uh, Google and Charter Schools, you'll see you know half of the top ten belonging to their websites, which I d really don't think people visit. The websites haven't been around all that long and stuff, but it's a total. And this uh, this um, damage control started after in 2010 in the fall after the first article which appeared nationally, which was on, in USA Today in August 2010. So it was like in that fall that these damage controls started. And um, so yeah, there, there's a lot of this interference potential in terms of information getting out there. Um, oh, I was going to say like for a really rudimentary site like my own, if I want to post documents, I use the um, website Scribd, which I can upload. Uh, documents to that. There was an internal audit report that hasn't gotten any play in the media that was damaging to the schools in um, three, three of the schools, it was of three of, the, of these particular schools in um, Los Angeles and it was released at the end of August and the board down there hasn't discussed it. The media didn't pick it up and so I just recently um, posted on script and that's that's one way I can get my the documents showing. You know. Um, I, I, you know, I guess, like in, in conclusion, I guess, you know, oh, you know, there's something to be said about um, institutionalizing this information. Like, for instance, you know, I'm, I'm kind of tired of, I, I only have so much time and energy, right? I mean, this is like a really consuming thing for me. I mean, my family would say I'm obsessed, and they're probably right. Because there's just, this is, there's such important, um, this is such a big problem and there's just not, it's just people don't know about it yet. And um, although they're learning, um, you know, we've been tracking, you know, things like when when uh, Waiting for Superman, that, that film uh, was released, a documentary that is a, uh, you know, dissing public education. You know, you just, all you, all you do is like, go find out who's behind it and try and get that out. Now, when uh, Won't Back Down, which was the most recent one, the fictional account, uh, to uh, bash public education. When that came out, Parents Across America was like way ahead of that in terms of finding out um, 
who was it connected to produce, producing that movie. And there was actually like a, a great response. Um, critics picked up the information about you know the, the propaganda links and um, and that movie did not that movie did really really poorly. Um, It'd be nice if you know more people were able to produce videos and films about this. Um, Michael Moore, in terms of my issue, is completely missing in action, which uh, I've written to him about, and I don't know why. Why he is? I'm sure other people have written to him about it. Um, yeah, sustaining the effort is a really big um, uh, issue when it comes to these types of projects, and you know, they need to be institutionalized by more powerful organizations that can hire people to do the type of thing maybe that I've been doing and um, get the word out more. Thank you. That's it. That's what I'm saying. When you were asking about you know what good content is, it's this kind of thing. It's yeah. really unique you know, investigative reporting. You know, unions should treat their websites as you know reporting outlets uh, for their news. If they did more of that, it would be tremendous. You know, they'd be seen as contributing to you know what's going on out there. Because a lot of units have their ear to the ground; they know exactly what's going on. For whatever reason, they may not want to release it, but they have to change their mindset and start putting out you know, really good new information to people. And that, I think, that's key. You know, AFT and NEA should be funding her and, and uh, you know doing more of this stuff. Jen. Yeah, um, could you say Ulu's first name again? Fetula. It's F E T U L L A H. And um, do you know where he I mean, got money in the first place to install? Where, where does the money come from? You know, just Is think there about any Goldman Sachs connection. No, no. He's built his <laughs> dynasty, his <laughs> empire now by himself. Just think of uh, people. Compare him to Billy Graham. Just think of him as like one of the evangelists who built an empire in this country, Christian evangelists. In fact, the Gulen movement had a conference in 2008 where they invited US Christian conservatives to Turkey so they could work on creationism together, on getting creationism in the school. Okay? You know? Um, I have a question about, not so much about the substance of your issue, but the process of using social media for outreach. Are there any lessons that you've learned having done this that um, that you could share with the group about things you might do differently uh, in the future? or? Okay, if I had known anything about this, I probably wouldn't have used blogspot because I hate the word blogspot, first of all. I just hate it. It's an ugly word, you know. and. Yeah. And they they uh, originally just had one template, you know, but now they have different, a, a wide, they, they expanded that and they have different pages and stuff. So the organization of it is not bad at all. Um, but I mean, I, maybe I'd go by WordPress to me, sounds more classy, but um, and I don't know about WordPress's features, but they're probably comparable or could be even better. Um, so the names may be like Privet or Primate, you know, I wouldn't have picked that. I have reasons for picking that, you know, that were personal. Um, because I remember reading something about um, how uh, they've done a, st I, I, it's a study on baboons or some, or some sort of you know monkey type species, you know, and, and they said there were certain you know when you look at a, at a, at a group of those, um, certain of them would be always on the edges, and they would be the ones who would be sort of more like highly strong and stuff, but they would also they wouldn't be in with the core group, they would be on the edges, but they would be the first ones to sound the alarm. <coughs> when there was danger. So would you have picked a more searchable name? Probably, yeah. yeah. But I didn't know what I was, I mean, I can't fault myself because I didn't know what I was well, doing when I started, right? Right, right. sort of on retrospect, yeah. So people say, what is that? And it's kind of like funny, you know, but, but um, yeah. And then sustaining it, you know. I mean, I would really like to have intentions of doing a similar, website for Oakland Charter Schools that show the connections and the board members of the Oakland Charter Schools and who's sitting on them, who's involved. And I actually kind of started that and I just I just kind of don't have the time, you know. And I pitched out some for some help and some people sent some things, but 
You know, it takes a certain type of personality to do the type of research I do. I mean, I just navigated my way to this and found that I'm, you know, fairly good at it and I like doing it. But so yeah, being able to sustain something is you really have to think about what you can do. That's in a way why um, you know an organization that has funding could do that, whereas I could not. Because at some point it's going to peter out, I imagine. Yeah. Sharon, great presentation. Um, thank, you. thank you very much, Sharon. And um, I think it also shows that the unions, which are being affected by privatization, the AFT and the NEA, that have the apparatus and resources, need to start focusing it on privatization, who's behind it. Uh, we have to ask ourselves at the Labor Tech, why is it that Sharon, uh, a parent, former nurse, has to spend her time doing this when the unions are being destroyed, public worker unions, by privatization. And there's no information by these unions about these issues in depth. This is what we're talking about. A lot of union leaders it's, a, it's a question of survival for the unions because charter schools now are growing throughout the country. Uh, and here's an example. Even uh, one thing that uh, uh, happened is CBS did a 60 minute, did an interview. Uh, with with him, Fatula Gulen, about the schools and about the corruption and the problems in the schools, and and you won't find that uh, you can't find that on the AFT and NEA websites. That why is that? I mean, in other words, 60 Minutes is covering that national story on privatization, charters, Gulen, Turkey, the connection, and it's not on the websites of our national unions that are representing educators. You have to ask, what, what is going on? There's a, there seems to be a disconnect. And I, I'm glad that Sharon has taken up the task to get the information out, and uh, we're going to get it out and make sure that people are aware of it. So uh, one of the things also that we did was we did an interview with Sharon, the Labor Video Project, uh, and also in Turkey uh, uh, about Gulen and how he was involved in jailing uh, journalists, which we just heard to uh, earlier this, this morning, sick who was jailed, Ahmed Sik, who was jailed because he wrote a book. Uh, it, was, it wasn't even published and he was put in jail in prison in Turkey uh, because it showed the connection between the police who he was infiltrated in Turkey and his movement. So he was put in jail in Turkey before the book was published so people would not even know about this information. And that's another issue of freedom of communication, democratic rights. Um, so also we have watchers who are watching labor tech online and uh, are, want to disseminate this information. So one of the key uh, supporters of labor tech is John Perulis. He's been doing the streaming and, uh, and he's going to talk to us about his experience about streaming. And every union local can have your own streaming channel and have your press conferences, have your stories online. So you don't have to rely on somebody else to tell your story. So uh, John, do you want to join us?